Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. I wanted to do another video commentary on a police interrogation video, and I say interrogation, the police use the word interview, but it's really an interrogation. The interview language is a framing device. They want to make it seem less threatening, both when they're trying to get you into this room, but also when they're framing it for the media, the courts, and so forth. We all know what it really is. It's an interrogation. One of the things I really wanted to do, and I'm now having the opportunity to do, is a video where the crime is not something super serious. Most of these videos that become readily available are pulled by media groups, and the reason why they look at them is because they're for things like multiple murders or some other shocking kind of crime. And those are going to be different than the kind of the ordinary interrogation, which will be something like around a stolen car or something like that. And there's going to be a whole lot of differences because, for instance, on the multiple murders, they're going to pull the guy who's got 30 years of experience or, you know, somebody, they're a game guy and not sort of whoever's available and has some training. Most of these interrogators have less experience than that and they get their experience in these kinds of moments. And they may also take different approaches because if you're trying to do an interrogation for something like a car theft, well, you've got a volume problem. You're not going to spend six hours on every car theft. So you kind of want to get to the point a little faster. Whereas, you know, the video I covered previously was the Alec Manassian interrogation. That one, they're going to take as long as they need. There is no time pressure. It's not like, hey, get out of there. We need the room. It's however long this takes is however long it takes. So I want to jump in here. Uh, the one I found is uh, with regards to a charge of breaking and entering. So let's have a look here and I'll just note, uh, I'm going to give some details now and I'll talk about some more details af after we've seen the video. But uh, there was a break and enter at a jewelry store and the accused here was picked up uh, basically immediately after. So very close in time. All right, let's uh, jump over here and have a look at the video and I'll sort of cut in with comments. I've seen most of this video already. It's not really a blind review, but uh, yeah, it's 25 minutes long. It'll be a bit longer with uh, with my commentary. Okay, take a seat and then make yourself comfortable. Okay. Uh, I'll be back with you shortly, okay? All right. Can I get you a drink or anything? Uh... Not as yet. I might have to use the washroom soon, though. Use it right now if you want. If you're uncomfortable. It's right back. Thanks. All right. So a couple of things here. Uh, you know, they'll say take a seat, and they gesture to the chair that's in the corner. In fact, all of the chairs are going to be positioned in the corner. It's a, you know, it's sort of a an uncomfortable spot to be in. We don't like typically being cornered. You'll see that that little table that's on the one side there is kind of this half table. That's that the investigating officer, the interrogator, can sit either on the other side, but they can also move along to the side of that table and really box you into that corner. So that gives them that option. Uh, the reason that we see this start out with him basically going, are you comfortable? Do you need anything to drink? Do you need anything to eat? Um, and he says, I need to go to the bathroom. And the officer is immediately obliging. That's because if they do make a statement that's harmful, the officer doesn't want that to later be potentially challenged in court on the basis of, I only made that statement because I really had to go to the can and they weren't going to let me go to the can until I, you know, told them something. So that's the only reason I said that. Uh, the other thing is that uh, when you accept food and water from somebody, it tends to build a rapport and a feeling of sympathy. So sometimes with very serious crimes, you'll see the media commenting, oh, well, they gave this guy a cheeseburger or something like that. They're not doing it because they like him. They're doing it because it's part of their interrogation script. It's part of what they do. They're doing it to get information out of the person. So anytime you see somebody in the media say, oh, well, you know, clearly they like this particular accused person because they gave him a cheeseburger or whatever, um, that media commentator is an idiot and you should disregard pretty much any of their opinions. All right. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here because there's about two minutes of him going to the bathroom. You can actually hear it. And I think that YouTube would not appreciate uh, me playing that for you. All right. We're just going to jump to when he comes back in the room. Well done. No problem. Take a seat. I'll be back with you shortly. Okay. Okay. Oh. 
Now, I'm gonna skip ahead for some of this, but you can still see and hear him, notwithstanding that the officer is out of the room. Like, you can hear him snap there. Uh, often, and especially on uh, more high-profile things, they'll let you sit for a while. And, you know, that's just so that they can observe how you're doing. Sometimes people will say things or do things, you know, you might hang your head, or you might, uh, you know, say something like, oh, I really screwed up this time. That's on tape. But if you think you're alone here, and you think you're not being paid attention to, you are absolutely going to be recorded. And did you see the camera adjust? Like, somebody's actually paying attention to him here. Uh, as I said, this is a 25-minute video, so they're not going to leave him in here that long. And at this point, I'm going to jump ahead to when the officer comes back. Uh, it is a gonna... little more than a minute here. So, all right, jumping ahead here. Or maybe a little less than a minute. About a minute that they leave him in there. Sorry to keep you waiting, Michael. That's okay. I'm tired. It's been, long two, it's been long two days. Uh, this is one of our interview rooms mm -hmm. here at uh, Hamilton Police. And this is audio and videotaped. Yeah, no, that's not Okay, right. I, you know, obviously not a stupid man. Uh, video camera. Microphones. Microphones on the wall. So everything we say and do is recorded. Mm -hmm. That's for both of our benefit. Okay. It benefits everybody. It really benefits the officer more than you. Um, they'll usually point this out and say, listen, you know, you know, this is audio video recorded. That's to really try to forestall an argument. Although uh, if you, if your argument later was, I didn't know I was being recorded, you're probably not going to be successful because uh, yeah. Uh, they often sort of start that out. When he says one of our interview rooms, this is clearly what they call sort of a hard interview room. It's a small, they're typically small, sort of mostly featureless cubes painted usually in a bright, stark color. I suspect that this is a bright white room, but uh, we're getting this blue tinge, I think, because the camera's not that great. Uh, but I could be wrong. It could be a slight, uh, slightly blue-tinged room. They have other interview rooms that are sort of soft interview rooms, and those typically have couches and cushions and art on the wall. They're a much more welcoming environment. They're usually used for interviewing uh, complainants, especially vulnerable complainants, uh, people who, you know, children, people who've been the victims of very serious uh, other kinds of crimes. I don't want to tick YouTube off here, but you can possibly read between the lines. But usually when you're the accused, you end up in one of these rooms, a hard interview room. Um, and I'm going to just discuss the situation with you. Great. Okay. Okay. Um, before I do that, there's something I have to read to you. Okay, and that is that... Uh, You're charged with break and enter. Mm -hmm. And the reason why he's going over his charge, this is probably going over it again with him, but uh, you've got a right to be informed of why you're in custody, what they, you know, why they've got you there. And actually, if your jeopardy changes to something more serious, like if they start out thinking, you know, let's say they start out and they think that you were breaking into cars, and then later, because of your admissions or because they find something out, they think that you might have actually been involved in a murder. They might be required to, like, re-caution you here and say, just so you know, um, your jeopardy has changed. And now we think that you're possibly involved in a murder as well. And they'd probably also have to advise you that you've got a right to speak to a lawyer again at that point. And that's what you're arrested for. And it's my duty to inform you that you have the right to retain and instruct counsel without delay. You have the right to telephone in private any lawyer that you wish. You have the right to free advice in private from a legal aid lawyer. If you are charged with an offence, you may apply to the Ontario Legal Aid Plan for Legal Assistance. The 1-800 number 265-0451. It's a toll-free number that will put you in contact with a legal aid duty counsel lawyer for free legal advice right now. Michael, do you understand that, that I've, what I've just told you? Yeah, and the person that you hooked me up with earlier, really that's... It's kind of out of sequence because you've already had that legal okay. counsel. 
So what you're seeing here is he's already talked to a lawyer. Uh, this detective is reading off a card. So basically he's got a card with a script for how to go through this and to make sure he doesn't screw it up. Uh, the reason why is that this is super important. Uh, they don't want to, you know, forget to advise this guy that he's got a right to talk to a lawyer because then this might get thrown out. The other thing is that even if they've already gone through this, they're almost certainly going to go over it again just to make sure it's captured on this video because this video is going to be played in court. And so if there's ever any dispute over whether this guy was advised of his right to speak to a lawyer before he made any statements, then you just say, look, it's, you know, it's right here. There's the timestamp. So that uh, that's one of the reasons why they, they do it this way. Now, a very seasoned, very senior investigator may dispense with the card. Uh, sometimes they'll do it just by memory, much more casually, and that also allows them in some ways, uh, in some cases, to frame the questions differently. So sometimes what you'll see is them saying, listen, you've got a right to talk to a lawyer, and do you understand that right? And so they might hedge away from ever asking them qu the question of, do you wish to talk to a lawyer right now? Usually the card actually will include that, although these cards vary from uh, police department to police department. They all have their slightly different phrasings of the cards here. I have to give you this right, okay. and it's best that I give it to you while it's all recorded. Do you wish to call a lawyer right now? No. Again, you already have. Yeah. We've spoken to a lawyer on telephone. So he's confirming that just to make sure that that's recorded. You know, you did speak to a lawyer, you had that right. Now we're going to keep going here. Uh, anytime the officer asks you if you want to talk to a lawyer, the answer should be yes. Uh, especially because as they said in this recording, I think every province has uh, set it up where you can access a free lawyer, you know, where you can talk to somebody for no money to get help when you're in this situation. And I mean, when do you get to talk to a lawyer for no money? It's just a, a real gift. So make sure you do it. Make sure you listen to them because I'm sure that, uh, you know, just what every lawyer is going to tell you not to be in this room, to not provide a statement, and it's good advice. Okay. And you're charged with break and enter. Do you wish to say anything in answer to the charge? You are not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so, but whatever you do say may be given in evidence. Well, that's fine, because what I have to say is to plead my innocence, so I don't mind that being. Okay. But uh, I'm just curious to know like, how it got this far, because as I said to you earlier in the other room, the police officers that were stopping me on the street said that they had witnesses that I... Well, in the, you now, lots of people want to be in this room because they want to know what the evidence is against them. And this is a really bad way to get the evidence against you because the police officer first doesn't have to tell you anything. They can they can just ignore that question. Uh, and second, they can actually lie to you about the evidence against you. They can tell you that, you know, we've got six eyewitnesses and they all identify you and two of them identified you by name. And, you know, it may not actually be true. So... Uh, <laughs> You know, this is a really bad place to be intelligence gathering. He also says, listen, I'm innocent, so that's why I want to tell you my story. Well, that's how you go from being innocent to being convicted, because lots of people uh, who, lots of people who have ultimately been cleared in terms of like DNA evidence uh, showed that they weren't the offender, uh, ended up getting convicted in large part based on things that they said in a room just like this one. You wanted to talk to me about the events in the other room, yeah. and I told you that uh, that wasn't the right time and place to discuss it. Remember right. that? Yeah. Yeah. The reason why it's not the right time and place is they really want it to happen on this video so that they can say, listen, uh, you know, there's a couple of things. First, if it's not on the video, somebody might later say, listen, uh, I only said that because I was being pressured in some way or forced. And they might also say, listen, the officer's notes, because the officer would, instead of having it recorded, would just be writing it down on paper. They might say, listen, those officer's notes didn't correctly capture uh, what I was saying, or perhaps they didn't capture the inflection or tone. Um, that may not be accepted by the courts, but it's a concern. So that's another reason why the officer is going to say, listen, let's get you into the interview room. Then you can spill your guts. 
Uh, there's one other thing I have to tell you before we discuss this, okay? Okay. And that's that if you've spoken to any police officer or to anyone with authority or if any such person has spoken to you in connection with this case, I want it clearly understood that I don't want it to influence you in making any statement. Basically, all I want is, all we're interested in is the truth. Mm -hmm. And if you've had any conversations with any other police officers and they've, they've discussed this with you in any way, it should have no bearing on what, what the, the conversation that we have. Okay. Okay. So this is typically, I mean, it's phrased a little clumsily here. I don't think he's reading off the card at this point. But uh, what they'll say is, listen, if anyone else has promised something to you or threatened you in any way, um, you should ignore that and just make a statement here. Uh, the reason why is that goes to a concept called voluntariness. We only allow statements in if they were made voluntarily. So if I was a police officer and I bring an accused into this room and I beat him with a pipe and say, listen, uh, you know, in, we're going to keep beating you until you confess, the guy might say something and it's clear that the only reason he's saying it is because he doesn't want to be hit with a pipe anymore. So that would be an involuntary statement. But similarly, you can have less uh, dramatic kinds of threats or promises. You know, it might be that somebody says, listen, um, if you confess, we'll make sure that your family is looked out for. And, you know, so the person is doing it out of concern for their family. The court might say, maybe that's not a voluntary statement, uh, especially if it gets really specific where, you know, the guy says, listen, uh, my family can't cover the rent this month. And the officer says, oh, well, you know, we have a fund. We'll make sure that, you know, just so long as you confess, we'll make sure that their rent is covered. It might be, listen, this is not a voluntary statement. He's only making that statement in order to, to get that benefit. So that's why this is there, just to say, like, to disclaim that. Okay. Um, why we're here is because earlier tonight, you were arrested for breaking out to a jewelry store on John Street South. Um, now, the, your innocence and guilt in this, quite frankly, uh, isn't an issue. Uh, the evidence I have is, fr frankly, conclusive and overwhelming. Okay? Uh, now, this is a fairly common tactic where they basically say, listen, we already know you're guilty, so really we just want to find out what happened and why, and maybe give you an opportunity to say, oh, uh, it's not that bad, because a lot of people faced with this tactic will go, oh, well, they've got overwhelming evidence, so I guess I'd better confess because it doesn't matter, and you know they think it's going to make things better on them. It doesn't. Um, it, anything you give them at this point, you're basically giving away for free, for no benefit, and but this is a really uh, kind of obnoxious tactic where they're telling him that the evidence is overwhelming, and I'll get to more of that why or later. But uh... um, so I'm not even going to ask you if you did it. What I'm what what I have to ascertain here is what kind of guy you are. Okay. Um, whether whether this is you're like a serial burglar, and this is what you're doing all the time or whether this is a one-off thing because of the power cut and everything that's going on tonight. So they're giving him an option, you know, are you the really bad guy or did you just do it this once? Notice that either of the options that he's being presented are is a bad option. Um, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, I just did it this once because of this, you know, that's a confession. Uh, but he's basically going to be trying to shut down any denials that the uh, that the accused makes here and try to push him to this, you know, take the lesser of these two bad options, which is still really bad. It gives the officer everything he wants here. That's that's all we're here for. Um, okay, I understand your position. Like I yeah. say here, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, and you've heard that a million times I'm sure in your career, but it's just... Ask me questions, that's all I can do is answer them, I guess. I've got no questions to ask you. I mean, why, why did okay. you do it? That's, that's basically, yeah, that's, that's my only question. But coming from that position, and, I'm, and since I'm saying I didn't do it, I really don't have an answer for you except to say I didn't do it. Okay. And you see how the questions are really phrased in a way to make it difficult for somebody to deny it. You know, all I want to know is why you did it. Well, I mean, there's a kind of assumption there that you did it. And 
I mean, if he's, you know, when he says, I've got no questions to ask you, then why are you in the room? Of course he's got questions to ask you. Uh, never believe the officer, you know, when they say this kind of thing, because they might be full of crap. And, yeah. Uh, yes, we haven't really got a, really. a, a great amount to talk yeah. about. Yeah, it's, it's like I said, the, whether you did it or not is not up for the discussion. Okay. It's always up for discussion. Um, it's really not. But you don't want to be there's discussing number, it with the officer. Of Great. One of whom had a video camera. Perfect. Yeah. That's not the reaction the officer was hoping for. Usually when they say, you know, there's witnesses and it's on camera, people go, oh. Now, that may or may not be true. It may or may not be true that there's actually witnesses. You know, just because an officer is telling you these things doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, that this is something that happened. So this reaction is really not what the officer was probably expecting, and again, not what they were hoping for. Because he's like, fantastic, thank you. I'm glad you've got this on video. Okay, yeah, well, that's that. relieving. So, that's relieving, to be quite honest. Yeah. So view the video camera. I have. Okay. That's why your guilt isn't in, in, in issue here. That doesn't even make sense to me. You see him making the confused, the stink face there? The, like, what? Yeah, it's, and I mean, often people will say, I want to see that video and the officer is going to make some excuse, you know, oh, we can't do that. You know, we can't show you this. Of course they could if they wanted to. They just don't want to for various reasons. Because if I'm on the video camera. What? That doesn't make sense. You have a video camera that shows me? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. It makes perfect sense to me. Uh, we'll have to, I guess, I have no choice but to get a lawyer then, if this is the kind of thing you're going to well, go through is, with me. This, I isn't, mean, go, this isn't going to go away, you're, you're, you're charged with breaking and you will be charged tonight. That. Okay. You will be going to court in the morning, uh, charged with breaking and with intent. Now that kind of statement that he makes there, the, I guess I've got no choice to get a lawyer, you don't want to be mealy-mouthed about this. If you want to talk to a lawyer, say, I need to talk to a lawyer right now. Um, because sometimes people have been, or the police have been able to get away with not providing counsel because somebody doesn't articulate it, you know, clearly enough. They say something like, well, I guess maybe I need a lawyer, uh, when really what you should be saying is, I want to talk to a lawyer right now. Now, he probably wouldn't actually be allowed to talk to a lawyer if he did that, because he's already spoken to one. And here in Canada, you pretty much get one chance to talk to a lawyer before the interview room. And they don't have to let you re-speak to a lawyer unless somehow your jeopardy has changed. And that isn't something that's happened here. If they said, listen, um, we just went back to that jewelry store and it turns out that, uh, you know, the owner of the jewelry store was there and was murdered. So now it's up from a break and enter to a murder. Then they'd have to let you speak to a lawyer again. But here they could just ignore him. Okay, that that's... That's what's going to happen right now. Can I ask you something? Okay, are you just making this up that you have a video camera so you see how I react? Because it goes no, 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 that really. if you're saying, okay, let me up for a second, please. If I am guilty, as you believe, because you have me on video camera, then okay, we'll go through the procedure. This is a very different or very dangerous line of response from this guy because if he's misheard like let's say this audio quality is not that great that could come out as i am guilty uh you don't want that and uh these kinds of hypotheticals can really run you into problems they can be played off by a skilled police officer or otherwise you know cause you some trouble uh but he's saying like listen are you lying about this video camera i mean they absolutely could be that is absolutely an option that the police have here. But I'm saying, I, I, you know, I'm trying to call your bluff here because since I know I didn't do it, there's no way I can be on the video camera. Well, like I say, this isn't so, game, it's not a game of poker. Okay. Well, I've, got, I've got nothing to gain from that. I'm not trying to give you a hard time, all right? You know what? I've got nothing to gain from that either way. Um, it's not a game of poker because a game of poker is fair. Uh, this is a very slanted game. Uh, yeah. Which is why I'm not asking you, did you do it? I'm not trying to catch you out. I've got nothing to gain from that. Okay, well, I'm here to ask, do whatever you want to do. The circum I mean, the circumstances are that uh, three people who live across the street saw you uh, hiding in the 
the way there, pulling the glass out, breaking the glass. When the police officers, the two uniform officers who uh, arrested you, pulled mm-hmm. up across the street from you, they saw you run off down the alleyway, and then they described the police officer who arrested you chasing you on foot. And that police officer then arrested you around the corner. So... This police officer recognizes me in green shorts and white t-shirt with a knapsack. The witness, all of the witnesses, saw you running from the store, being chased by the police officer who arrested you. When did yeah. this take place? Like, how long before when, uh, I was arrested? Like, he ran immediately before seconds. Well, this isn't me. That's what I'm telling you. Okay. So when the the officer keeps saying like, "Oh, your guilt is not in question," um, why else are you in the room? They that's what they want to you know get you to confirm. That's what all of these questions are about. That's why he's telling him, you know, we saw you do these things and so forth. Now, uh, there is a substantial bit that the officer is leaving out here, and I'll tell you what that is uh, later on as we go. That's right. Do, do you own a bicycle? No, not in, not here in Toronto. I do. Yes. Where do you live? Nine, in here, Hamilton, Nine Delaware. Okay. How long have you lived there? Uh, I moved in, I guess, the year in August. Right. When in August? Oh, what date? I don't know. Yeah. I, I bought the house in April, uh, April 30th, and I didn't move in until August. So, I okay, my first week of August, whatever it was. I can't Do you remember. live there all the time? Yeah. So you, you don't own a bicycle? No, not here in Hamilton. But there's one in, you have one in Toronto? Yes, I do. Do you have a, another dwelling in in Toronto? Uh, no, I have another property, but I don't live there. Do you own it? Do you rent it? I own it. My mother lives there. Now, most interrogations actually start with this phase where they're asking sort of very simple questions that maybe don't matter that much. Um, some of these might be relevant. I don't know if maybe the burglar was seen with a bike or something like that. But, uh, you know, usually they want to do these kinds of innocent questions early as a rapport building tactic, as a way to say, uh, listen, we're we're all friends here, right? And it might be that because this is not going the way the investigator wanted, uh, that he is now trying to back up. And a really skilled investigator doesn't end up in this position because they do the investigate like that part first. Um, it's really hard to once you've gone hot, it's very hard to back away and uh, go back to kind of a friendly chat. But, uh, I mean, this guy is less angry than some people. Some people, in response to these kinds of allegations, um, either out of innocence or out of guilt, uh, will get angry and respond to it. Um, it's really worth noting that uh, an innocent person and a guilty person look very similar in an interview because... The guilty person is trying to pretend to be the innocent one. Uh, you know, they're putting on an act, and so they're going to exhibit similar behaviors. Uh, but lots of people will get angry and be offended by the suggestions, and then it's hard to get back to this kind of rapport-building scenario here. So, Who owns that property? It's in my name. How long have you owned that property in Toronto? Uh... Almost two years now, actually. So do you, do you own the whole house in on Delaware? or Yes. Okay. And do you obviously go to and from Toronto a lot? What, do you yeah. work in Toronto? Yes, that's correct. What do you do there? I set up exhibits at trade shows. Right. How long have you been doing that? Since 86. Can you describe to me or just tell me what, uh, what you're doing tonight before you got arrested? Now, just note here, this guy doesn't fit your typical profile of a guy breaking into stores. Uh, you know, he's got a, a job, apparently. He's got, you know, he owns property. That isn't to say that lots of people who have jobs and own property aren't also, you know, breaking into things because addiction is a hell of a thing. That's usually what you see here. But, uh, you know, this... This is somewhat uh, relevant, at least, in the sense of makes it less likely, or at least, you know, might suggest something. 
Oh, certainly. Yeah. Um, I was at work. I caught the 12.30 bus to Hamilton. They pulled in a station. I walked from the bus along, like, on the inside of the station there where the, the docks are, down the stairs, up uh, John Street, crossed John Street. There was an EMS vehicle there, if that helps to like, be a witness. But anyways. Now, I'm just going to mention that this kind of talk about your day thing can be really dangerous because let's say uh, the police probably don't have the resources on this on a break and enter. But let's say that they did think that this was a murder or something where, you know, the purse strings get opened up in a big way and they can put a lot of investigation there. Let's say you are telling them what bus you took and you got the bus number wrong. Or let's say the police go to confirm something and they can't because there just isn't the information there. They may infer that that's a lie and then decide that you are absolutely their guy. So this kind of talk about your day thing, you might think, oh, it's harmless. I didn't do anything. Um, it can absolutely be used to convict you because if the court thinks that you're lying in something like this because, you know, oh, the cops tried to confirm this and, you know, we couldn't confirm that he was on that bus or something like that. Uh, you could, you know, that could be something that is absolutely held against you later on in both uh, charging decisions and decisions as to whether to continue to prosecute, as well as in the court case itself. Um, got across John Street, walked maybe three paces, five paces, whatever, and then crossed on across Hunter to the north side of Hunter. Did you and run, then did you run at any point? No. I mean, there weren't any cars, so there's no reason for me to go quickly across the street. I mean, what, what happened when you were arrested by the officer? Oh, well, I, I could see figures, but it's dark, right? And and I could sense, like, that person's coming towards me. And I was like, whoa, what's going on here? And then the flashlight came up, and I thought this, and then there's more than one voice, and I thought, something's up here. And then they didn't identify themselves as police officers, but I. Well, they were in uniform. In the dark, yes. So, yeah, the, uh, you know, there's a potential situation here where the officer might be trying to forestall an argument around, you know, use of force or something if the, uh, especially if he had resisted arrest or something like that, because sometimes it can become a live question as to whether or not you knew it was a cop. Because, you know, there's a very different scenario between, let's say you're walking home alone at night and somebody says police and they're there in a full uniform and they say stop and you uh you know and you take off running versus let's say you're walking home alone at night and a dark figure steps out and says stop and you take off running because you think holy crap who is this guy uh that can be a very different legal scenario so the officer's like well they were in uniform right he's trying to and yeah it's it's in the dark dude I, I like this guy. And so then behind flashlights. So my point is I cannot tell who's behind a flashlight. And I think he's I making can, a I good point. A weapon. And but the point, the time to be making these points is not in this room. It's later on down the road. And I was kind of like, they're saying, get down ground. I'm kind of like, uh, okay, like cooperate. And then. I'm thinking, I don't know the police officers. And I said as such, like, who are you? Are you are the police? And he's like, like, what do you think? As a response. And and that's, you know, you'll see this in actual video where officers will get sarcastic and they should never be doing that. Like, if you're a police officer watching this, if somebody asks you if you're police, the answer should never be, what do you think? The answer should be, yes, we're police. I'm officer so-and-so, badge number so-and-so get down on the ground you know it that might not be the case if this guy is you know holding a gun or something but you know what do you think is never going to be the right response and i don't know if this guy is record you know recounting things accurately or not here but uh i've i've seen it on you know dash cam videos and so forth so it's credible to me when he says that that was the response I got on the ground the next thing I was like police so all where, around me. Where, where, where exactly were you when you were arrested? Major, let's, can we do it on the board here? Sure, sure. How's that? Yes. Want me to do it? You set up exhibits, you're probably more artistic than me. When you um 
I'll maybe draw a layout the of the, the streets yep. and maybe a dotted line that's your path. How's that? Sure. And uh, another dotted line where the, where the police officers come from. Uh, now, I've said before that if you're in an interview room like this and your mouth is moving, you're making a mistake. But if you're in a room like this and you're writing something down or drawing something, then you're definitely making a mistake. Uh, yeah, don't don't do anything with a pen in one of these rooms except to possibly sign documents to be released, you know, like a uh, an undertaking or something like that where it's, you know, we need your signature so that we can let you go. But, um, and again, that's only, you know, a legal document, not we need your signature on this confession so we can let you go. Uh, yeah, this just makes me wince. Okay, this is the, the tunnel, the bridge. Okay. And come at the bus station. So which way steps. is north towards the lake? Uh, the n north. Okay. And so I came here, the car, the EMS truck or whatever ambulance it was. You see the camera move again? Somebody's been watching and sitting on that camera the entire time. The whole time. So this interrogation that you think from in that room is being conducted by one officer, it's at least two officers because guy on the camera. So again, never think that you're alone in that room. Never think that... Uh, and that second officer sitting there watching the camera uh, he can go and provide tips to the first guy. You know, he could say, oh, you missed something. Go and ask this. Uh, in fact, when the officer, you know, officer one leaves the room, the first thing they're going to do is have a little confab and talk about what they're, you know, whether they need to hit anything else, whether there's any sort of lines of attack they could, you know, approach. But uh, I love that this video shows this. Is there, went off, crossed here, and crossed here. That's it. Okay, did you come straight from the bus? Yeah, absolutely. Like I even looked, I said, maybe I should take a cab. I'm like, oh no. Okay, so you yeah. came straight off of the bus? Yeah. Now, can you imagine you are under stress here, you get this drawing wrong? Again, that's something that they would take as, you know, either a lie or, you know, this guy says he knows the area. This is his route home from the bus. How does he not know this? You know, yeah, it's, this is not, uh, not a great place to be where you're drawing stuff out like this. And that's it. Like the buses. Ooh, that's it. It's like I was off the bus like maybe what two minutes. So how how long before you were arrested did you were you off of the bus? That's what I'm saying. Like from there to there, it's like not even two minutes. Did you uh, go any stop or do anything uh, in the uh, in the interview? I was walking. I was trying to see in the dark and questioning. You know, like. Am I going to get mugged? And that's about it. So where, where... Now, that's a bad comment to make. Walking, questioning, am I going to get mugged? Uh, the other thing I want to note here is that the investigating officer's tactics have changed quite a bit here. Now he's trying to get him to tell a story. This really should have been the initial outset of his approach. Uh, get all of this stuff out there and then hit him with the, you know... And I think that what's happening here is, as mentioned, this is not... Uh, a multiple murder. This is, you know, something where there's a time crunch. They just want to get this guy and move on to the next guy. And so they're sort of mixing up the steps. They're trying to jump to the end of the interrogation because if the guy just says, oh yeah, I, you know, well, if you got me on camera, then I did it. So yeah, then they can save all this time. Uh, if I don't think that this sequence of events in terms of this interrogation would ever happen in one of the full on, like, we think we've got you on 12 murders kind of scenario here. Uh, this is very much, uh, something has gone wrong for this interrogator and that's what's happening here. He's trying to back up and do, and I mean, this works on a lot of people. Uh, Cause you gotta remember most people who end up in this room are also not very skilled at standing up to this kind of interview and this kind of interrogation. Where were, you, where were you when you first became aware of the, the people who subsequently oh, well, were police officers? Okay, well, there's a building here in the corner. Uh, that's a, like I got an entrance to whatever, parking or something, and there's another building here. There might have been some, I think I, yeah, actually I was walking. I saw a, fl a flashlight or something there, and I can hear hollering. 
and then someone else is here and that person or maybe I don't know maybe that person ran I'm not sure but uh, anyways I was approached here Okay. Good. Great. Thanks very much. Take a seat. What uh, what time did, what, did you get on the bus in Toronto? Twelve thirty. I'm not trying to catch you out. It's no, just no, I did. No. I didn't the catch you the first time. I, the more he's absolutely trying to catch him out. The more information I give you, uh, I think, is the better. And what time did it arrive in? Uh... That is always the wrong way to be thinking, uh, including if you're innocent. You know this thing of if I give you more information. The more information you give them, the more the likelihood is that they'll find something to get you on. Uh, Hamilton. Well, I didn't look at the clock, but usually an express is about approximately 45, 50 minutes. The traffic was good, but we did. there was a guy on who wanted to get off of Burlington, so he did pull off the highway to some intersection, not the station itself. And I believe the, the driver's name is Bobby. Um, and there's about four of us on the bus. So, I would say it was less than an hour. Right. Okay. Like I said, on the information I've got, you, you're going to be charged tonight with breaking and entering. Mm -hmm. However, I do have a duty to make sure that the truth mm -hmm. is... And the tr basically, the truth is paramount, and the, tr the true version mm -hmm. of events is paramount. And I have a duty... Um, to investigate all of this, and I will investigate. Okay. I'm sure you will investigate this story thoroughly. Mm. Keep in mind, when they say the truth of events, what they mean is we think you did it, and we want to get to that. Uh, so, mm. and uh, hopefully, um, I'll be able to find something here mm -hmm. which will either prove or disprove mm -hmm. okay. the, the you know what we've discussed tonight. Yeah. Okay. Problem is the speed at which this is going yeah you know like when i was on the ground i think go quickly to the terminal i have like six or so guys around me you know like talk to the bus driver right. you know like i like i can't i mean i can't comment on things that okay yeah, scene, i know unfortunately but um but now i'm i'm left kind of, hanging right now i mean he absolutely could comment but he's not going to i'm looking at this i mean this is the basically on the evidence i've got this is the only course of events that uh, can take place right now. But I, I will certainly make sure that this is looked into thoroughly. Okay, uh, okay. I, I can give you my word on that. That's my duty. That's that's what I have to okay, do. I trust you will. Spoiler alert, um, they didn't. Okay. But I'm just saying it's a shame that I don't even know where I'm staying tonight. Like, what horrors are ahead of me. But, I mean, this is... Okay. Uh, Wait for me a second. I just have to... Uh, Okay. So as I said before, now he's going back to have a little confab with the, you know, with the camera operator, with the guy, you know, the other officer who's watching this. And, you know, they're going to have a little discussion, see what they want to do, and come back with anything else because they still want this guy, right? They still, they still want this guy to confess. And that's been their goal from the outset. But, uh, Again, this is not uh, a multiple murder. They may at some point just go, I guess we're not getting anything here. And uh, here, you know, again, they're going to be observing. If he does something at this point that makes them think, oh, we got the right guy, that's something that they can use. You know, if this guy says something, you know, uh, sometimes people say, oh, yeah, you know, I think I fooled them. <laughs> Whoops. One thing, that's, uh, one thing that's come to light. When you were arrested, you had uh, an, an object in your hand. A ratchet, yeah. Can you, can you tell me about that? It was in my pocket, and to be quite honest, I was thinking I should have something in my hand <laughs> because I was walking home, which doesn't sound very nice, but that's the why it's there. Um, Whoops. Um, now, he wasn't ultimately charged with this, but they absolutely could have. 
Um, they could have charged him with possession of weapon for purposes dangerous to the public peace because now, you know, he's said that, uh, listen, I was worried about muggers. I had this ratchet. I, you know, had it in my hand because I was, this is a bad neighborhood. And I, you know, it's, he's made it clear that his purpose for having this is, I mean, certainly this is a work tool because this guy sets up and takes down trade shows. That's what he does for a living. Uh, or at least did at the time of recording this video. This is quite an old video, so I don't know what he's doing now. But, uh, you know, when he's saying at this point, my intention for why I have this is at least in part to defend myself against some unknown person who might attack me, they could absolutely have dinged him uh, with possession of weapon for dangerous to the public peace, and they may well have been able to get a conviction on that. So this is a terrible set of admissions. Talking uh, has really hurt this guy in terms of his legal standing. No, and, criticizing you for that. And and this is like the moment. Everything else up until this point, uh, he hasn't given away too much. Uh, although, again, you know, there's various ways that they could go over the stuff he did say and use it against him potentially if there's errors or you know omissions or anything like that. But uh, especially omissions are a big problem when you've made this many sort of comments. They'll say, hey, you said, you know, you didn't stop, but here you, you know, looked at this newspaper box, you know, and for 30 seconds and stared at the, uh, you know, stared at the headline or, you know, something that he, they'll say, oh, you didn't tell us this. That's an omission. Therefore, maybe this whole thing is just a fabrication. But here he's actually given up what could potentially have been charged as a criminal offense and potentially enough evidence to uh, secure a conviction on that, which is really a bad thing. Like, don't talk to the cops is advice, you know, is the advice given for a real reason. That's it. That's, that's, that's a tool I use at use. That's like quite common. Okay. I have spares in my bag, you know. So. Okay. So when that's you're... the reason. So when the officer approached you, I had it in my hand. You had a ratchet, and it's just a tool. Was it like an Allen key? Yeah, thing? there's a like, like a, a corner key socket I mean, ratchet. Exactly. What I have at work, we have aluminum. Uh, I think it was a big erector set. We build frames and stuff that have a lock, and it's a ratchet. And sometimes corners are like 45. You need that corner key. I understand that. Anyways, that's the tool, and that's why I had it in my hand. Okay. Have you ever had any? Uh, do you know any people who live? I know, on John Street there, who might... I don't know anybody. I know like three people in Hamilton, period. Okay, so you don't know people who live on John Street no. there? Yeah. And I mean, that's real common in cities. Um, you know, people don't necessarily know everybody, but uh, I'm sure that what the officers are thinking here is he's got this object because it's a tool for breaking in. You know, he's already described this as, you know, somebody was breaking the windows and removing panes of glass. They'll be saying, listen, you know, the reason why he had this or what he was doing with it is smashing that glass. So this sort of admission that that was in his hand is also harmful to him on the underlying the break and enter allegation. So people would have no reason to make anything up that you can think of? No, not at all. Just something we have to eliminate? Yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any... And, you know, right there, he's eliminated an entire potential defense at trial. Whoops. Anything uh, you'd like to ask me about this? A million things, yeah. Um, what's okay? First of all, what's the next? Where am I going from this seat? From here, you'll go. Basically, you'll go to. It's three ten after three in the morning now. Uh -huh. uh, in the morning, first thing in the morning, you'll go to court. Since okay. the court building's open, and uh, I won't be asking for custody for you. I'll be asking for a conditional release. Basically, you. I'm asking that you'll be released on. A form of bail. Okay. Um, with the charges pending, the charge being break and enter. Now I'll just note here: they could have released him at the station. There's various forms of release uh, that were available to them, and where they could have just said, "Listen, we know it's 3 a.m., but sign this piece of paper, and off you go." Uh, but they didn't do that. They held him into the morning uh, so that he could attend court. And from what I understand, his release conditions were actually quite strict. Okay. I don't actually have a full description of what uh, conditions he was on, but uh, this is Ontario. Ontario, they love imposing all sorts of ridiculous conditions. 
Um, it's quite shocking to me often to see releases from out of Ontario, given, you know, the very different cultural practice out here. So that is just a comment. I suspect that his release conditions really sucked. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to get off the call. I was just wondering, can I make a phone call? Because I'm supposed to be at work at 8 a.m. Uh, you're not going to be able to be at work, are you? I know I'm not going to be able to, but I like to phone ahead. I can arrange that uh, that you get the phone call to let someone know that you're not going to be at a place here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We know we're not in the we're not in the business of uh, trying to get people well, in trouble with their all employers. This money. So. We're not in the business of trying to get people in trouble with their employers. You could have released him, and people get fired over this, right? You you no show or you call from the police station. You say, "Hey, um, I can't be at work," and they see on the call display, "Oh, right, this guy's calling from the cop shop." Lots of people get fired over stuff like this. So, yeah, I mean, they didn't have to let him call his employer. It is a they are doing him a solid in that respect, but they could have done him a much more serious solid and just let him out, you know, on on a, you know any sort of release document here. Uh, promise to appear would have been appropriate. I guess I get it, you know, no, it's, so. and, you know, it's we're not in the business of getting people fired that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Okay, well, okay. that's one concern and. So I'm hanging out in that room till 10? No, whatever. we'll be taking you downstairs okay. uh, to uh, a larger custody facility that we you have downstairs. Okay. Well, it's not the most pleasant place in the world, but it's only for a few hours. Okay. And sometimes people get stabbed in those few hours. Okay. Uh, from, from court tomorrow, what happens there? I don't know. The, the Justice of the Peace makes a decision. Okay. I can only tell you what I'll be requesting. Uh, that's okay. a conditional release. Well, that sounds lenient. I mean, you could. Why well, did the, the case isn't up for trial? Uh, I don't know how to engage in these things, but I'm asking that you that you. The presumption is in favor of bail, especially when we're talking about a guy with no record, uh, allegation of break and enter. Uh, yeah, the the it is expected that he'd be released on bail and without you know having to put up cash here in Canada. Be released on some form, some conditions. Okay. Okay. Um, that's it. And after that, we get notice in the mail, or like. No, yeah, you, you'll be served. You'll be given your court date tomorrow. Okay. Okay. His release paperwork would have a next court date on it. All right. Um, and I've always, uh, I've already advised you. You know, your your right to legal yeah, advice, that yeah, kind exactly. of stuff. Well, and you're obviously, aware I have to because I don't know a thing about this. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I'll make sure that you have my information if you have any other questions or your lawyers any questions mm -hmm. then, uh, then you can contact me here okay well I'm and kind I will, of look, into, I will look into all I, of this I trust you will yeah you will. I trust you will um, you know I want to make, make sure we got the whole picture okay okay well thank you I guess <laughs> those promises aren't worth anything by the way okay uh, you're not in an enviable position and uh, you know I understand so. the like the process I just I'm not satisfied with it. That's what I'm saying, you know. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't and expect that you're going to be happy with it. You know, and I'm thinking, I have no disrespect to you, but I know someone sitting in this chair has probably lied to you a million times, right? So I'm thinking, what can I do to uh, convince you? I try to give you the information. You've, you've, been, you've, you've, been, you've been very good to me, and I, I try and try. There is nothing you could do to talk them out of, you know, when they've made that decision to charge you, it is virtually impossible to talk them out of actually pulling that trigger and charging you. Uh, virtually impossible. Treat everybody as an individual. Okay. And my main aim is the two things is that you get your rights mm -hmm. uh, that you're, you're entitled to under the Constitution of Canada mm -hmm. and that uh, you treat it decently and uh, that the truth comes out. Yeah, basically well, just that, that's being doubted until proven innocent. That's, I guess, the premise here, right? From my point of view. Okay, so that, that's that's my the, the the things that I look for. I know. Innocent until proven guilty is going to be followed in the courtroom, but the officer doesn't need to. You know, he's not necessarily going to be thinking that way. Uh, in general, it, they're going to be taking the view that if you came in in handcuffs, that that you're the guy who did it. That's just how they usually think. Okay, cool. Right, and I can show you that's. Uh, I'm interested in nothing but those things. All right. Well, I'll give you more we'll the same okay. okay. So it's uh, three thirteen in the morning on right. Friday, the fifteenth of August, and uh, I'm going to be concluding this interview now. Okay. 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 So.
if you want to just come with me. Okay. And that's all she wrote here. So when we're looking at this, um, I'm going to give a little bit of the, the postscript, uh, some of the details that I knew at the start of this, but that uh, I didn't share with you guys. So the first is that uh, the initial report was, and this is from those witnesses that they indicated that they have, they did have witnesses, uh, but the reports were that a short white man wearing white shoes had committed a burglary. Uh, this is a tall black man who was arrested wearing black boots. And so in terms of him fitting the description, he fits the description almost not at all. Uh, he is a man. That is the extent to which he fits the description. And, you know, it's uh, ultimately in the court case, the court did not decide that uh, that racism was a factor. However, they did decide that he had been wrongfully arrested and he was awarded more than $40,000 as a result of it. Uh, it was deemed to be quite an egregious violation of his rights here, and that basically there was no reason why they should have ever arrested him, that there was no indication that he was involved. Uh, keep in mind, you know, we're talking about a situation where somebody is allegedly, like this is their version of things, picked up immediately after a burglary at a jewelry store. Uh, there's all sorts of things you might expect to find on somebody in those circumstances, like jewelry in their pockets. You know, I don't know if the allegation was that somebody successfully stole anything. Um, did they have broken glass in their shoes? Did people often cut themselves in the process? Was that the case? But surely you want to get somebody who vaguely meets the, uh, you know, the description there. They said that uh, they thought he could have been a suntanned white guy. Come on. Um, at the trial, the officers who arrested him insisted that they had the right guy. So you're thinking, this is a guy who is factually innocent. You know, he is clearly innocent. And, you know, you'll watch that interrogation. He sticks to his guns. He does not give anything away with respect to the break and enter. He makes no, um, uh, you know, he doesn't say I did it there. Uh, there's all sorts of places where I think he could have run into trouble, uh, he does come, he, he does either admit or come close to admitting another offense, that being possession of weapon for purposes of dangerous to the public peace. I don't think he was ever charged with it, and I'm glad because, as I said, he shouldn't have been arrested. And to the extent that somebody who's walking home in a bad neighborhood uh, reaches for something in their pocket and goes, if I'm in trouble, I'm going to, you know, this is what I'll use. Uh, I don't think we should ever be convicting anyone for that. But he faced that risk because he talked. He got nothing out of talking to the police. He got nothing. And, you know, if you think that you can do better than he did, you're wrong. Uh, he he did really well, and he still screwed up. So, you know, talking to the police is always a mistake, including, and in some ways, especially if you're innocent. Uh yeah, this, and you'll see, the officer just never changed his mind. They went ahead with the charges. They they went full speed ahead. Um, he ended up spending the night in custody. This guy did not talk himself out of, out of a minute of jail. So, yeah, a lot of lessons to be learned from this one. I really like that I had the opportunity to look at this one. I'm going to see if I can dig up some more of these uh, lower level uh, interrogations because... As much as the Alec Manassian is really kind of fascinating, I think that there's more to learn out of this one. Uh, and it's shorter, so maybe you guys will have more patience to watch it. It'll be one video that's an hour long instead of like five videos that are an hour long. Yeah, uh, sometimes I really appreciate your guys' patience with me because, yeah, some of those are some epic, uh, epic quests. Bottom line, this is a guy who's clearly innocent. I mean, he doesn't meet the description that was given by the witnesses, even a little bit, except for just being male, which, you know, half the population. Every other detail that they give is contradicted by, you know, him. You know, he's not a white guy. He's not wearing white shoes. He's not a short man. He's a tall man. So every detail that is specific to an individual points to some other individual. And 
if this was his testimony on the stand, I'd be saying, fantastic. This guy is providing a very credible account. It's internally consistent. It's clear. But it's still a mistake to provide this to the police officer. I mean, it provides that they can prepare for it. You get nothing out of this. He certainly didn't get out of being charged and, you know, spending the night in custody. So he got nothing out of it. And in fact, he exposed himself to some legal risk. I don't believe he was ever charged with the possession of weapon for purposes of dangerous. Uh, I suspect that a judge would have uh, would have found a way to acquit him here because under these circumstances, you know, you just don't want to see this guy getting dinged when he's clearly been, you know, improperly arrested and so forth. Uh, but his his only legal risk here is from this statement. Uh, if the Crown was trying to go to trial on the basis of, listen, uh, a short white guy wearing white shoes broke into this place and we arrested a tall black man wearing black boots, you're going to lose. Like the Crown, I, they're going to yank that. That's such a garbage file. So... Yeah, giving the statement is a mistake, notwithstanding the fact of his clear innocence and that he just wants to provide, you know, his side of the story to establish that. It was a mistake. And, you know, it's a mistake in whatever circumstance, almost always. But if you're in custody, they'll say, do you want to talk to a lawyer? Call the lawyer. You know, there's free legal advice out there. Call somebody. And, you know, if the lawyer might have a different take on things, listen to your lawyer. Anyway, thank you for watching. Uh, this has been a fun one to do. I'm going to see if I can do more like this. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters because if I'm going to be doing more like this, uh, what I'm probably going to have to do is ask for these videos and that's probably going to cost some dollars. So that's uh, where things like this come in. At the $50 level, Jonathan Wheeler, Canada's National Firearms Association, Mike, Kyle Martin, the CCFR, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited and Mark Olivier Damour. And at the $20 level, Peter Hilger, Matt Ward, Mark Whittington, Jane Babin Luxor, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Bruno R., Andrew Elsich, Aaron Del Sue. And uh, thank you as well to all of the $10 supporters who are going to be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge and see you next time.